And so as our meditation comes to a close, gently bring your awareness back to your surroundings, into this time and space, into your bodies. And when you're ready, please open your eyes. We welcome those who have joined us while we were in meditation. We're glad that you're here, and we're so happy that you're here with us, either in person or virtually. Let us begin with our opening chant, God is in this place. So now let us join together in prayer, knowing that there is this one omniscient presence, the divine God is flowing in us right here in this very moment. And as we come together, we know in our oneness that God is at the core of our life. And so we just give thanks for this beautiful evening together. We give thanks for our musicians, for all the behind-the-scenes people. We give thanks for this beautiful day that has unfolded. So we are here in celebration of our lives, saying, yes, God, yes, I am here to serve. I am here to say yes. I am here to have all of the amazing, great things that I know there are unlimited possibilities, and I am standing in my power in this very moment. We are so grateful, so grateful for everything in our lives. And in this gratitude, we simply release the word into the law of mind, knowing in the mind of God it is already done. And together we say, Amen. Will you please join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. in time I was almost out of my chances pain a 
and sorrow had a rhyme I had given up on romances I'd gotten out of line forgotten the design I was running in the forest love took me by the hand and helped me understand showed me something everyone's made of love beauty And where would I be if I hadn't found me just in time? Love took me by the hand and helped me understand, showed me something. You do this every single time. And I don't know if you all noticed what Tina's wearing. You should definitely, because the dress itself has all of these wonderful words like love and romance and peace and all of that. So she themed it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I've been working on a theme for this month of November, which you like that little segue? It's a bridge, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I studied um, about speaking your word, and tonight, last week we told, we talked about speaking your word for radiant healing and wholeness, and tonight we're going to be looking at the idea of speaking your word for inner and outer peace, and it's an interesting idea because inner and outer peace, you'd think wow, there'd be, there'd be so much profound that can be said about that. And absolutely there is, except that what I have discovered as I was working on this talk is that this idea of inner peace requires a lot more inner investigation and accountability than I had anticipated, just as, I, as the talk unfolded. Whenever I write a talk, it begins to take on its own life, and it goes in a certain direction. And this one began to go in a direction that was very interesting, because it, it caused me to have to do some more work. And you know how we love work. <laughs> so I had a very interesting experience the other day. Um, I was coming back from, um, from Portland, Oregon. I had flown up there uh, for a few days to do a celebration of life for one of my dear friends. And so I was in this space of, 
wow, we did so much healing and there was reconciliation that took place and lots of love and, and connection and, and friends because I've been working up there for the last, oh my gosh, 17 years. And so it was just this wonderful um, healing and uplift. And so I was at the, the terminal, I was at the airport on Monday. My friend that I stayed with dropped me off and I checked in for the flight and then walked the very long distance to the gate because they're doing lots of maintenance. And so it was quite a journey. And when I got to the gate, there was a woman who was there and it was the very last gate in the terminal. And she was absolutely reaming and destroying the poor gate agent for putting the gate so far away from security. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's fascinating. She's blaming her, this, this woman who has nothing to do with it. This woman, we'll call her Karen, who really, um, <laughs> what? Um, so <laughs> she was just really, she was taking it so personally that she had had to travel all this way. Now, do bear in mind, this is all through my filter, okay? So I felt sorry for the girl and I, and, I went to the gift store and I got two big family size bags of M&Ms and took them to the gate agent because I know that they're going through a lot right now. You know, people are arguing with them about everything, the time of day. And so I said, I just want you to know that not every customer is going to be disagreeable. And, you know, you, we really appreciate that you are doing such, such a, a lot of work and it's really hard. She goes, I know, can you believe it? Like I have anything to do with where we put this thing. And I said, I know, I know, and, I, and I'm really sorry that you had to go through that. But, you know, I really appreciate you, and, and, and people really appreciate that you're working really hard. So once I boarded the plane, um, Karen was in front of me in first class. <laughs> and she was having trouble lifting her bags up to put them, you know, in the overhead compartment. So I immediately got up, walked up to first class, and offered to help her. And her response was, and I quote, it's like we're in a third world country. <laughs> My inner response, inner, varied from a sarcastic, you're welcome, to no, no, this really isn't anything like a third world country. Um, unfortunately, I remember Dr. Mark's rule, not every thought is worthy of sharing. <laughs> So I kept my own counsel, I smiled a little, went back to my seat, but my sense of inner peace was now officially on its way to becoming an outer side eye. You know what a side eye is, right? Y'all know it's this, you know, if somebody does something you don't like, you go, I'll do it for you. <laughs> it's the judgment eye, and I was well on my way. And actually, as I think about it, now, I'm not really following Dr. Mark's rule because here I am clearly thinking that my thoughts are worth sharing because I'm sharing them with you, so. <laughs> what disturbs our inner peace? Think about that. What disturbs your inner peace? Um, for me, it's stuff like other people. Bad drivers, rude drivers, um, long lines at the grocery store, printers that don't behave like printers, yeah? Late checks, late fees, parking tickets, and family members. <laughs> what, do you, do you want to add to that? Just yell them out. Let's hear it. Ego. What's that? Ego. Ego destroys your inner peace. Oh, you went right to the end of my talk. Stop it. <laughs> mean, bosses. mean bosses. I got it. Yeah. Well, and here's another one. How about vacuous newscasters? You know the ones who get finished telling you a story about some major horrific tragedy and then turn to their co-host and with a bright Hollywood smile, they say something like, well, Kiki, I hear our weekend weather won't be giving us any traumatic brain injuries. Now tell us about the fun in the sun we can look forward to. That's, that's one of mine. So there can be times when it's really challenging to remember that the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi starts off with the words, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. And that's really the way that prayer goes. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. No side eyes, no side eyes. That's, that's God calling. But there's a part of me that wants to rewrite it sometimes to read, Lord, make me an instrument of thy snark. 
Where there is hatred, let me offer greater discord. Where there is doubt, let me sow fear. Where there is despair, cynicism. Where there is darkness, more misunderstanding. Where there is sadness, let me add to the trauma, the confusion, and anger. Now, aren't, aren't there just times when you feel like you just want to dive in with both feet and make that mud pile just get bigger and get on everybody? I mean, admit it, right? We just have those times. You know, if I were not in this teaching and not deeply, deeply committed to being a space of compassion, of space of healing, of light and possibility, I could probably make Joan Rivers sound more like Mother Teresa in comparison to my gift for judgment and sarcasm. But why would I want to do that? There might be a momentary ha-ha, but the pain that happens when we do that to our own precious, beautiful souls is really, really damaging. It's really hard to recover from that when we are the ones who are wielding the weapons on ourselves. And by the way, we are the ones who wield the weapons on ourselves when it comes to soul damage or pain. We tend to do that. And I think that when our own peace and our sense of well-being are shaken, we tend to move really towards finding those things uh, that fall under the heading of defensiveness, right? The illusion of protection that comes from building a wall of judgment is hard to dissolve. And it certainly doesn't dissolve with more judgment and protection. It really doesn't. And any situation like the one I found myself in the other day certainly did not need more judgment and did not need more frustration to add to that cauldron of what was clearly going to be a very interesting mix. Um, so what is it that we're afraid of? Why does practicing peace within our own daily exchanges sometimes seem to be so hard? Are we afraid of the personal vulnerability or are we resistant to the personal responsibility? There's a difference there. There is vulnerability involved, but then there's a responsibility. There's an accountability. You know, my big takeaway as I was working on my talk this week is that it's not even necessarily my judgments of other people that disturb my sense of peace. It's my expectations of them and their failure to do what I think they should do. How could they not? I mean, don't they know? Don't they know? This is my script. I don't care if you didn't get it in the mail, that's my script. You know, how could that woman be so selfish, I asked myself. In reality, the voices on planet Sydney are saying, how could she not do what I would do and be more like a, what I think she should be? How could that happen? How could anyone be so entitled that they think traveling in first class on a jet from an airport that is comfortable, carpeted, and safe is anything like a third world country? You know what, it's none of my business. In reality, the, the upstanding and very moral, apparently not very compassionate, yet very, very superior feeling voices on planet Sydney are saying things like, she needs to be nicer. How could she say something like that? And of course, the kicker, she should not be wearing those pants. <laughs> you know, no wonder we don't have outer, uh, inner peace or outer peace. And I know, no wonder I don't. It's because I'm a brat. It's my lack of peace that's demonstrating here. You know, the mean lady sh shouldn't wear those pants, but it's my lack of peace about that. It's not her problem, it's mine. You know, I, I have to tell you, I have created any number of peace vigils over the last 10 or 15 years and people are really eager to show up and shine a light for peace because peace as a general and a community concept is really easy to talk about and to light candles for. We're all in for this because it feels really good in that moment to be a part of something greater, to be a part of something bigger and to have that intention for peace, for love and for healing. Mm, but the inner work of peace is another matter. This community, this community is used to, well used to engaging in the inner work 
that spiritual growth requires. And it's one of the reasons I got so excited about coming back here, because I know that there's a vibrancy here, there's an aliveness, and there's, there's an interest in doing the work, even the, when the work is hard, even when the work is scary, even when the work requires growth, when it requires pushing past those comfortable lines that we have put up, those walls that you know, judgment will never dissolve. It's just that these gifts of growth that we get to experience come from intentional growth. And we are an intentional community. Intentional spiritual community, I believe, is the future of healing and bringing peace on the outside to this planet. Intentional communities. So in our Science of Mind textbook, and for those of you who don't know, Dr. Ernest Holmes founded this teaching Wow, a long time ago, well, about 100 years ago, let's just go there. And he put together the finest ideas of philosophy, psychology, spirituality, wove them together in this very practical and inspirational teaching that we call the science of mind. And it is for the intention of creating a better world, a better life, mm, a sense of peace and happiness within, and to know wholeness to know wholeness. So every time I contemplate a sentence from the textbook, and it's one that's been on my path for about 40 years, I feel a, 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 a convergence with harmony. I feel a sense of peace. And the sentence is, peace is the power at the heart of God. Peace is the power at the heart of God. Peace is the power at the heart of God. That brings me assurance, it brings me calm, it absolutely brings me, you know, peace. So I was thumbing through a book that was written a few years back by David R. Hawkins called Power Versus Force. And it's a really wonderful book. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so because it, it brings a very clear understanding about the difference between forcing your way, and I'm not talking about Star Wars, the force, that's a different idea altogether, which is closer to power, this idea here, but when we force our way, when we, oh, when we just muscle our way, when we get our bulldozers out to force other people to believe what we do, to do what we do, or to behave the way we want them to behave, then we are out of alignment with what really heals and transcends and lifts us up. It is power that is peace. And he wrote this, power arises from meaning. It has to do with motive and it has to do with principle. Sounds like what we teach, right? Power is always associated with that which supports the significance of life itself. It appeals to that part of human nature that we call noble. In contrast to force, which appeals to that which we call crass. Now there's an interesting word, right? Power appeals to what uplifts, dignifies, and ennobles. Force must always be justified, whereas power requires no justification. Force is associated with the partial, power with the whole. Now, if you think about that, that's peace. Peace is that power. It's associated with the whole, and it is about that transformation and that lifting up. And another line from the book, it's the same book, which I really love, force always moves against something, whereas power doesn't move against anything at all. Power gives life and energy, Force takes these away. That's profound, I think. So last week, I used a phrase, and it was from H.R. Jeffrey. H.B. Jeffrey? H.B., right, Mark? Thank you. And some of you were really moved and wanted to hear it again. And truth is its own power, was the phrase. Truth, capital T, truth is its own power. And that's what we... That's what we engage with here, is spiritual truth is its own power. It is its own wave. It is its own, that which engages, gathers, and, and lifts us up because it is the spiritual truth of who we are. And that truth, that big T truth, is that we are divine beings. We are spiritual beings living in a spiritual universe which is governed by spiritual law. That is that divine truth, that capital T truth that is absolutely unassailable, except if you've never heard it before and you don't know it, you might be living to some of the small T truths, 
which say, you are subject to being a victim. You are not worth very much. Other people get more than you do, or you're too old or too young or too whatever, fill in the blank. But the spiritual truth is unassailable and unchangeable. We each are the divine in clothes. We are the way that God shows up in this world. So if we think of truth as its own power in terms of those same ideas from David Hawkins, we end up at that same reverent, magnificent place of divine spaciousness. Oh my God, it just feels so opening, 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 opening. Okay, I'll practice that word later. Peace is the power at the heart of God. Truth is the power at the heart of God. And you and I are the heart of the life, the mind, the body of God. So our nature yearns for the kind of peace that comes from fulfillment or at one We yearn for that. Whether we can put it into words or not, our essential and our existential hunger is for connection and it's for safety. It's for peace. It is for that peace. You know, we long for it, but I think that we are individually and collectively so hungry for that same meaning and connection that we have accepted the lie or the illusion that only by force can we get our needs met. Only by force can we get our meaning and our connection. Only by force can we finally be safe, can we finally be protected, loved, supported, or strengthened. We feel that we better get this now before somebody else does, and it leads to this whole other realm of thinking about the other. The other is there to take away our jobs, our money, our safety, our comfort, our well-being, whatever that is. Because it's so much more convenient to look at somebody else as an enemy than to turn within and to look at the beliefs that we might have about our own uh, lack of worthiness or lack of connection to God. And when we finally stop blaming someone else, shaming someone else for that which isn't their fault to begin with, and can look at our own accountability for what we are thinking, what we are believing, and how we are outpicturing and living and expressing those beliefs, then we move into that place of personal responsibility. And yes, it does take vulnerability because we actually have to explore those areas, our psychic wounds, our our those places where we hurt, those places where we are squeezed. You know, life is gonna squeeze us. It's that friction that causes us to grow. It's the friction. You know, the metaphor for me is how a pearl is made in that shell, in that it, it is a grain of sand and it is friction within that body and it is the, the tissue and, and the material in the shell that is Resisting the friction, resisting the friction, resisting, resisting, resisting until this thing emerges that is this pearl. It is a pearl. That's, that's how we grow. It's the same idea of how we, how we move from that spiritual alchemy into golden beings. You know, the phoenix has got to rise if we're going to fly. And that phoenix comes from that fire, the struggle, it comes from the pain. Not that we have to struggle, we have to be in pain, but we have to be willing to not resist those things that we think are threatening our peace. To look at what we have been telling ourselves about that. How is this person really my enemy? Or is it the way I'm thinking about them? I remember years ago when President Nixon was forced to withdraw troops from Vietnam. The phrase that, that became um, very popular, the phrase that he used and so many others used to describe what the United States was seeking at the Paris Peace Accords was peace with honor. Peace with honor. Some of you might remember that. I find it interesting to consider that peace in any form might be without honor. You know, so I, ha I have to question that right away. I have to look at that and say, wait a minute, that is very odd that there's such a thing. Who believes that there could be peace without honor? You know, true peace means that love is present. The word peace is not a euphemism for a lack of war or a lack of dis discernible combat. That's not what peace means. In fact, Ernest Holmes defines peace both as a concept and a quality of God. 
And he wrote, it's a state of inner calm. An inner calm so complete that nothing can disturb it. The peace which comes only from the knowledge that it is all. It's all. A realization of our oneness with omnipresence brings peace. The peace which is accompanied by a consciousness of power. Which brings us back to that gentle place of God. That gentle place of love which is not a place of force or battling or fighting. The Bhagavad Gita says we shall never arrive at peace while we deal with pairs of opposites. And yet, in a world that is so anchored, anchored in, in binary understanding or misunderstanding, I wonder how many of us can, how, how it's so easy for us to default, to default into thinking that peace is being expressed if we keep our mouths shut about our warlike and unpeaceful thoughts, that's enough, right? If I just, if I just keep my mouth shut, then I'm, I'm expressing peace. Um, well, sometimes peace is preserved when I keep my mouth shut. Okay, so that's good. You know, it's not disturbed. But for me to think that I am a place of peace simply because I avoided saying what I was thinking, that's pretty bogus. My thoughts don't necessarily have to be expressed, but to, for me to think that I'm now, you know, the Dalai Lama's friend. Science of Mind teaches us that our thoughts create our experience and our reality. So if I am just burying my judgments instead of healing my need to judge, oh, ouch, I am in fact still creating. I'm still creating, and my creation then is anything but peace. So looking for guidance on this, I went to one of my favorite books earlier today, Peace is Every Step by Thich Nhat Hanh. And right at the beginning on page five, he wrote, peace is present right here and now in ourselves and in everything we do and see. The question is whether or not we are in touch with it. And I read this statement and I thought, well, Tick, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> Your entire life is dedicated to knowing peace through meditation and spiritual practice. And then I went, Oh, that's why. Knowing peace through meditation and spiritual practice, isn't that the whole point? Isn't that the whole idea? My role on this planet isn't to heal the planet, it's, except that it is. But I have to do it by healing myself first. You know, I think about, um, I get invites all the time, and you probably do too, for world peace meditations, especially over the last year and a half, almost two years with COVID. We get these things to meditate at home for a world peace meditation. And I think that they are so powerful and popular because we all have a need to be included. We want to be connected. And the vibration, truly, that's created by thousands, maybe millions of people holding intention for peace is amazing. And yeah, miracles do happen. But can you imagine what our world would be like if it wasn't just once or twice a year that that happened? That every single day, all of those people who signed on for the World Peace Meditation spent time in intentional contemplation of peace, meditation of peace, a, a practice, a spiritual practice of forgiveness, of love, of knowing themselves, not just for the big events, right? What if all of us practiced peace as persistently and fervently and consistently as Thich Nhat Hanh or the Dalai Lama? Da, Dala, wow, that is fascinating. I am like doing word salad tonight, aren't I? That's cool. Um, the Dalai Lama, can you imagine? Can you imagine? I know from my own experience that once or twice a day, once or twice a month, once or twice a week, doesn't do much. It lowers my blood pressure. That's good, right? Helps me to consciously connect with that truth within. But unless I'm practicing on a regular basis to build my muscles around peace, my understanding, my thinking, my habits, then I'm like someone who goes to a gym once and then gets frustrated because she isn't 20 pounds lighter than the day before. Not that I would ever do that. Um, one of the things that also jumped out at me in Thich Nhat Hanh's book was this idea. We are very good at preparing to live, but not very good at living. We know how to sacrifice 10 years for a diploma, and we are willing to work very hard to get a job, a car, a house, and so on. But we have difficulty remembering that we are here to live in the present moment, the only moment that there is for us to be alive. 
Every breath we take, every step we make, don't go into sting, can be filled with peace, joy, and serenity. We need only to be awake and alive in the present moment. We need only to be awake and alive. So who knew that peace on earth was so simple? Right? So simple. Here, most of us have been walking around thinking the job was way too big, that there were just too many people we'd have to change, or we have to wait for all of those war-loving folks to experience, let's call it the natural attrition of old age in the circle of life. Turns out that you and I, if we can just start to remember to be where our bodies are, peace will come. That's it. Start to remember to be where our bodies are. In fact, it's even easier than that. Thich Nhat Hanh wrote this too. We can smile, breathe, walk, and eat our meals in a way that allows us to be in touch with the abundance of happiness that is available. That's mindfulness. That's just simple mindfulness. So there's a term I like, it's critical mass. So it's not that we need a huge majority to be doing this and to know peace and to practice peace. It's just that we want to reach a tipping point, just a tipping point, tipping point to get us past the, just one more than of who says yes than the ones who say no, right? It's a tipping point. Critical mass is that, critical mass is that amount needed to begin the shift, and that's true of any change. It just starts with you and me. Our willingness to simply be mindful of our true peaceful natures will gently bring us into that wonderful place of being the change we wish to see in the world. Now there's a familiar phrase, isn't it? Be that change. And it does start with us. We have to remember to access, to remind ourselves that there is a place within that is the truth of who we are. And then those times that we don't remember it, the practice, and I love this from Thich Nhat Hanh, is to just slow down and begin to think about what you're doing. Just to be mindful of what you're doing, that I'm standing here, that there's a, a wood stand that I'm holding, that, that there's paper, I notice the paper, and to just be aware in this present moment of where I am. So I want to invite that awareness right now together. I would like to go into prayer, and let's use the mantra that Thich Nhat Hanh teaches and offers in that book. So if, would you be willing to join me in this? Okay. And we'll move it right into prayer. So I invite you all to take a deep breath and release it. And as you continue to breathe and just choose to be where your body is, I invite you to just hear this and say it silently within yourself. Breathing in, I calm my body. Breathing out, I smile. Dwelling in the present moment, I know this is a wonderful moment. Breathing in, I calm my body. Breathing out, I smile. Dwelling in this present moment, I know this is a wonderful moment. Breathing in, I calm my body, and breathing out, I smile. And it's in this awareness, this place of mindfulness, this place of just simply being aware of the, the sounds around us, the movement around us, the feel of the chair that supports us just as spirit supports us in our journey. That we engage even more deeply with the truth that there is one power and one infinite presence. It is God. It is love. It is that peace that so saturates, surrounds and fills all life that there can be nothing else but that. And as I know this for myself, as I know that I am swimming in and as that sea of God, that sea of love, that sea of good, I know it for all people everywhere. That we are connected in God and as God. And that as I turn within 
and know a greater sense of peace. That this in turn vibrates out to the world. And I know it for all of us that we in this room and out of this room, that as we begin to harmonize with the truth that there is only God, there is only good, there is only God, there is only good, that we are the denizens of that. We are, we are like broadcast channels for that. And it radiates from us. It is broadcast from us in such power and in such truth. And all we simply do is remember that breathing in, I calm my body. Breathing out, I smile. Staying anchored in this moment and noticing the breath. I know for all of us that despite whatever appearances or challenges might be arising, the truth is God is present through all of it. God is present in all of it. Light is shining in all of it. Wholeness beckons us within to remember and to know that we are the divine expressing in joy, in potential, in possibility, in perfection. And that nothing and no one can stand in the way of that, including me, including you. We cannot stand in the way of our own divinity. It's a done deal. We cannot stand in the way of our own wholeness. It's a done deal. We are the love of God in brilliant, radiant, divine expression. And all areas of our lives are now lifted up, are now transformed. And any thinking about it that needs to shift in order to accompany and to sustain and maintain a consciousness of well-being, of wholeness, of love, we are shifted to. Our thinking is now wonderfully Blessedly, like that, it is shifted. Like that, we shift. Like that, we shift. Like that, we shift. We shift, and we move into that deep awareness that it's only God, it's only good, and that we choose to be receptive to the highest level of good, of wholeness, of health, of understanding, of peace in our relationships, of peace in our families, of peace on our planet, and peace in our bodies, in our finances, in every area. We embrace and we know that God is all there is. And I say this, and I invite you to say it with me. I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. Let's say it again. I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. And so with a profound knowing of gratitude, the experience, the warmth, the delight, the excitement of being thankful that I know for all of us, ah, we accept, we accept. And it is in that space of thank you that I release this word into law, knowing it is so, it is absolutely done. Spirit is willing, the law is always receptive and is always, always active. And so it is, and together we say, amen. Thank you very much. I release and I let go. I let the Spirit run my life. And my heart is open wide. Yes, I'm
So now is the time in our service when we gather together in a celebration of grateful giving. So I invite you to take your love donations. And if you do this automatically online or you are somewhere not here and you can't immediately deposit it in that box that we have back there or you're doing our auto tithe, which by the way, I do, and I love knowing that I am automatically tithing. It just feels so good that I'm in that flow all the time. I really, really recommend it. Ah, I just invite you to take that idea, that thought of love, of possibility, of giving, and hold it to your heart and say these words with me. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you, God. So would you welcome back, give it up, for Suze Webster. She's got announcements. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a few announcements. So ways to make donations. Get the hair out of my mouth, sorry. <laughs> That's not one. Call the, you can call the office at 818-762-7566. You can go to nhcrs.org forward slash give. You can text the word give to 818-457-3419. Also, another great way you can help and donate is shop on Amazon Smile and select the North Hollywood Church of Religious Science as your charity of choice. We have prayer available after service today here in person and on Zoom, so we graciously give that gift to you. We love to pray with you. Next Wednesday evening is our pre-Thanksgiving service with Reverend Sydney. That's November 24th. Meditation is at 6.50, and the service begins at 7. And Reverend Sydney's topic next week is speaking your word for gratitude and abundance. Youth Church is open for Sundays at 9.45, and we welcome all youth of all ages. 2022 Journey of Heart campaign pledge forms are available in the foyer and online. Can't believe we're saying 2022. I'm like... Feeding the Homeless, our love and kindness ministry is Feeding the Homeless this coming Sunday. To support that ministry, go to our website. Volunteers and donations are always welcome. Christmas Giving Tree event 
Help make a child's Christmas a joyful one. Once again, we have adopted the children of North Valley Caring Services. Practitioner Gail Palat is on the patio or on Zoom on Sundays, and she's going to distribute names and gift ideas, or you can find her information on the website. Delivery of all unwrapped gifts to the church um, by November 28th with an appropriate size gift bag. The gifts will be distributed on December 9th. This is fun. Youth Church Christmas Program, Sunday, December 5th, in the sanctuary at 1115. Join us and bring all the kids you know for fun, festivity. This event is including singing carols, telling stories, a visit from Santa, Miss, Mrs. Claus, and a few elves. Way. Way. <laughs> Zoom virtual patio meets before and after Sunday and Wednesday services, and we have our Zoom meditation every Monday, every morning, Monday through Saturday at 8 a.m. Visit our website at nhcrs.org to obtain. Blah, 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 blah. It is. It is. Four hours of sleep is catching up with me today. Um, to obtain the Zoom links and more information about all our events, sign up for our weekly e-blasts and the monthly news met newsletter. It is contagious. I know, I know. <laughs> and now we ask Reverend Sidney to give us our benediction. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And as I do that, um, I just want to dangle a little carrot in front of you. On the 10th, we're going to have a holiday sweater Christmas carol celebration party. And my husband and I are going to be hosting this in this room and we're going to be singing carols and wearing your holiday sweaters. Now, okay, here's the deal. Some of you have some gorgeous sweaters. I know that they're spectacular. I, however, choose to go a different route. And, and um, some of mine are the ugliest things you've ever seen in your life. So I encourage you to be as free as you want, to dress without judgment, and to wear those holiday sweaters that will cause everybody to stop and go, oh my, because we need a lot of oh my in our world, don't we? Um, okay, so I want to thank a few people. Liz Racy has been holding vigil, and our Facebook Live support has been given to us by Melissa K. Allen. Our Zoom support tonight, Barbara Berg, Ray Regan, Alma Alvarez, and Reverend Nadine has been there, too. How is that? That's so cool. So in the sanctuary, our lights and sound have been handled by Adam Keshen. Keshen. Keshen, Keshen. I, I promise to learn it. Um, and you were greeted and ushered tonight, ushed, I think this is the word, by Colleen Butler and Luana Schertzberg. And we have a media team of Doreen Rima, Nick, Remo, Nikki Savara, Brenda Jordan, and Blair Thompson. Our soloist, Tina Meeks. Her music's on iTunes. Our music director is Sam Krieger. Pulpit support, Suze Webster. And I'm Reverend Sidney Steen. And I'm so shy. Okay. Let's just take a moment to go within once more. Taking all of this joy, this energy, this, this enthusiasm, knowing that this is the truth. This is the truth of who we are. This joy. This joy is absolute infallible evidence of the presence of God, according to Deschardins. So we know that the presence of God is here within us, around us, all through us. And I know for each of us, as we move out into the world, that we are instruments of peace. We are vehicles for love and for joy, and that we touch those both in our families and in our worlds, and those vibrations continue on. So that indeed, our world is transformed to it to where it actually is. We don't we no longer buy into the illusion that peace is not possible because we know that our source is peace, that our source is love, our source is wholeness. So we engage together in knowing that our world is peaceful because we are peaceful. 
So I'm grateful for all of this. I release this word into law. I let it be. I know it is so, and I invite you to say with me, amen. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Say